Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, RB, the RWB Jackson Lecture, named after Robert William Greeley, the first head of OISE, appointed by our very special guest, Premier Davis. My name is Lisa Wheelahan, and I'm the proud holder of the William G. Davis Chair in Community College Leadership here at OISE. Mr. Davis's establishment of Ontario's college system is a significant and enduring contribution to our community, to industry, and to students. Colleges in Ontario are among the strongest that I've seen in the world, and they are the anchors of their communities and an essential component of our social infrastructure. Canada has the highest attainment of post-secondary education in the world for those aged between 25 to 64, and this is because of the college system. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this very special event, those who have joined us in person, and to the many who are watching from afar, including many of our 100,000 alumni around the world. It is my pleasure now to invite Professor Glenn Jones, who is the Dean of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, and also one of the leading higher education scholars in the world. Thank you. The dean of this play. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, as many of you already know, Lisa is one of the more outstanding, one of the most outstanding scholars of higher education in Canada, internationally recognized for her work on the college sector, and she's clearly a worthy holder of the William G. Davis Chair in College Leadership. Before I continue, I want to recognize a few of the folks who've joined us today for this special occasion. I'm very pleased to acknowledge the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, the former Governor General of Canada, Mrs. Kathleen Davis, who's joining our honored guests, of course, today, Neil Davis, who also happens to be a member of my strategic advisory group, uh, Eric and Sarah Jackman, uh, the Honorable Hugh Siegel, the principal of Massey College, the distinguished OISE graduates that are join us today, including Sylvia McPhee, Cindy Sinclair, Peter Liu, Ed Thompson, John Delandria, Mark Fetterman, and Kathleen Wynne. I'd like to recognize uh, TVO head Lisa DeWild, the former Ontario Minister of Finance and Chancellor of York University, Greg Sorbera, former Toronto Mayor David Crombie, Mayor Tory is providing over City Council at this very moment and sends his regrets. Um, Principal of University College, Donald Ainsley. Rob Pritchard, the former president of the University of Toronto and a great friend of OISE. And former Dean of OISE, Michael Fullen. The Jackson Lecture is named after Bob Jackson, who was appointed by our guest of honor as the first head of OISE. I realize that many of you may be a bit too young to know of William Granville Davis's leadership in strengthening Ontario education. As former Minister of Education, then as Ontario's 18th Premier for 14 years from 1971 to 1985, Mr. Davis established our community college system, TV Ontario, expanded the university system, expanded rural education opportunities, and of course, created OISE. It is hard to visit any community in Ontario, large or small, but doesn't have a school or a road or a trail or other special gathering places named after Mr. Davis. He is rightfully recognized as one of the most successful and impactful premiers in Canadian history. Uh, as part of OISE's golden anniversary celebrations a few years ago, we established the William G. Davis Leadership Scholarship to support Ontario's future educational change makers. Thanks to scholarship founding members, Professors Carol Campbell, Michael Fullen, Charles Pascal, the Honorable Hugh Siegel, and Dr. Avis Glaze, who came all the way from British Columbia to join us today. We have raised over $130,000 and still counting as we move towards our target of $200,000. Naturally, uh, we have a table set up for if you wish to give a donation to this fund, and any don donation will help. But if it's $500 or more, you will receive a signed copy of a superb book about our guest author, written by our other special guest. In this regard, joining Mr. Davis, Ontario's all-time education premier, is the incomparable Steve Pakin, host of TVO's flagship current affairs program, The Agenda. As Mr. Davis's official biographer, 
there's no one better to engage in conversation with the Premier than Steve. Steve is a prolific author, and he likely knows more about the history of Ontario politics than any other living soul, and whose neutrality as a distinguished journalist is evidenced by the number of federal and provincial debates he's often been asked to moderate. Steve is a member of the Order of Ontario, the Order of Canada, holds several honorary degrees, though not as many as Mr. Davis, <laughs> and is currently the Chancellor of Laurentian University. Friends and colleagues, I'm honored to welcome the Honorable William G. Davis in conversation with Steve Pagan. How are you doing, Sally? <laughs> I, I, I think we should start by establishing the record. Can everybody hear me okay? No, not too well. How are we doing here? A little better right now? Yes? Yeah, but you're in the front row. What about the back row? <laughs> I think we should establish right off the top that I think Kathleen Wynne applauded for me, which I think has never happened before. So thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, former Premier. Uh, we thought we would spend a little bit of time here this afternoon um, talking about uh, the life of this man, uh, a bit of biography, a bit of education policy, given where we are today. And I thought we'd start with a nice non-controversial question. Who's a better education minister, you or Kathleen Wynne? We were both the same. Oh. I mean, I may run again. <laughs> I, you, you and I uh, have had, um, I'm delighted to say, many, many conversations over the years, both from you know, when I was at CBC and TVO, and for this book that uh, I wrote, I don't know if you heard about this, I wrote a book about you. Did you hear about that? Have you read it yet? Not yet. <laughs> I haven't read the first one yet. <laughs> uh, okay. You didn't read Claire Boys either? No. Because you could skip. You know, you should read mine. It's not bad from what I hear. <laughs> I think even the former Premier read it. Yeah, she says it's not bad. But I'm I was trying to think of kind of a, a question that I have not asked you before. Um, we got mic problems here, don't we? I can tell. Why don't we, uh, can we get some hand mics out here? <laughs> Audio is obviously a federal responsibility. <laughs> what do you think, guys? Is it all right, or should we hold, hold off for the hand mics? Hand mics. You can't hear, can you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they can hear. Check one, two. Hey, that's better. Okay, let's go with this. How's this? That's okay. Does yours work? Does yours work? I hope so. There we go. Now we're talking. Okay. I mean, I hope not. Go ahead. Now we're talking. You know, you're the second longest serving Premier of Ontario ever. Almost had the job for 14 years. I nearly stayed another four years. Go well, ahead. Well, you could have stayed another four years, but we may get to that later. The thing that I always found interesting is that you actually wanted to be the Minister of State for External Affairs. You wanted to be a member of parliament. You wanted to go federal. Your orientation was to foreign affairs. And you ended up in the job that you ended up in kind of by accident. Can you tell a bit of that story? No. <laughs> I mean, if he hadn't said by accident, I might have had something to say. But if he thinks I'm going to do it by accident, uh, you're wrong. Well, no. let's put it this way. It, it wasn't your plan. Nope. Any more? There we go. No, the head is going up and down, so it's working. Okay. Uh, yes, my ambition was to run federally and to be in the federal house. Uh, Gordon Graydon was my predecessor, and I was a great supporter of his activity. Uh, and then things happened whereby I was left with the opportunity to run federally when Tom Kennedy said, I'm done. And so that's what I did. Uh, I have no regrets. Uh, I look what happens in Ottawa these days, and I say to myself, thank heavens I was in Ontario. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that at all. Why are you laughing? <laughs> but uh, no, I, I had no choice. Well, but I had a choice. I could have waited, but I don't know how long. Your first election, you were only 29 years old when you stood for provincial parliament the first time. It was June 11th, 1959. Leslie Frost was premier, and you almost lost your first election. You want to tell people why? Well, you know why. 
I know why. Maybe not everybody here knows why. Is it why. in your book? It's in the book. Well, well, then would you tell these people what you wrote? If you and then I'll tell you whether you're right or not. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd read the book, I, you'd I mean, know I, that it's in the book. I, I, a long way from Brampton here. I mean, you know, it's the rural areas. And if you think you're going to get away with it, I believe you, the worst you're wrong. <laughs> so. Okay, well, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, John Diefenbaker was the prime minister. In February of the same year, he decided to cancel something called the Arrow, the Avro Arrow. Don't even remind me. The Avro Arrow, and I'm having trouble with this. Uh, with in the writing, I was going to run in provincially. Uh, and uh, we'd had some other difficulties, and it almost led to my defeat. We lost in Brampton, we lost in uh, the, the two abiding uh, communities, and we survived in uh, the very north end and the very south end, uh, in spite of John George Diefenbaker. Now, he was a very fine person, just totally wrong. <laughs> and if you write that in a review, I'll deny having said it. And now, why are you smiling? <laughs> the story <laughs> I heard. You didn't like him. <laughs> The story I heard was that you went down to Mr. Frost's office and you said to him something like, this guy has now torpedoed my chances of winning. Mr. Frost got Mr. Diefenbaker on the phone and what happened on that conversation? I won't tell you what he said to Mr. Diefenbaker because it's not the kind of thing you should say in front of a group, even to your wife. But there was some profanity used. There was, there was some, shall we say, indication that Mr. Frost was less than enthused. <laughs> okay. I mean, I learned a lot from Hugh Siegel. <laughs> you, you did manage to squeak through in that first election, and you became a backbencher, and you got to give the response to the throne speech as a 29-year-old, which I guess was a big deal back then, was it not? It was. I won't tell you who wrote the speech for me, but it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, 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 when you and I talk about this time in your life, I often hate to bring it up, because it's so sad, but it's an important part of the story, and, and we should get it on the record. I think a lot of people don't remember. Your first wife, Helen, got very, very sick and died at this time, and left you with four kids, one of whom is here today, four kids under the age of six or seven. And uh, John Robarts had taken over as Premier of Ontario, Prime Minister of Ontario, as they called it then, and he decided to keep the education portfolio for himself. He was Premier and Education Minister yeah. for almost a year. What happened at that time, Mr. Davis? Well, it's a very, uh, I didn't come here uh, to refer to this, but my wife is here and she'll understand. Uh, it was a very difficult period. Uh, my wife and I, we had four children. One of them is here. He turned out not badly. <laughs> he nearly ran federally the last election. He still may someday, but it was a very difficult period. And uh, when I uh, realized what had happened, uh, this is very awkward for me. Uh, I then did what the then premier suggested I do, and that was to pay some attention to what was happening, to take an interest in the field of education because he still controlled that, and he thought I might have some special interest. So while I spent some time, etc., uh, it was some months later before something happened. And uh, I have to tell you how difficult it was. I have to point out that my wife, who's who with me today and has been my wife for longer than she wants to admit, uh, and uh, added one more child to the family. And uh, she went to a, a university that I don't like a lot. Uh, and when I say I don't like a lot, uh, she said to me one day, why don't we go to the football game there? So somebody gave me some tickets. And so I went to see uh, that small university she went to uh, play against another one whose name escapes me, except I think it was, uh, uh, what was it called? Well, she went to Michigan, which yeah, is well, a small that, I was going to get to Michigan, yeah. yes. She went to the University of Michigan, and we played Ohio State. And I was there uh, to visit with the dean of the ed school in the uh, field of, uh, shall we say, the uh, uh, business of teaching people. And uh, it became something I did rather regularly. The only thing it led to was I got to know the governor of the state of Ohio, 
And as a result, I got free tickets to Ohio and Michigan when it was played in Ohio, and I found that very worthwhile. Huey Siegel was with me one day, and he was so excited, he stood up with such enthusiasm, the poor lady behind him had a big glass full of chocolate milk, and it appeared on the garage. Well, Huey, I shouldn't tell tales on you, <laughs> but that is factually correct. So what has that got to do with anything? Well, one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, my wife died, I remarried, we have five well, nice children. Is, now, this is why I like telling this part of the story, because... I, would, a, would you not say something a, a to woman, him? I don't <laughs> because a woman named Kathleen Mackay came along and basically saved your life. And yeah. she's right here, and that's why I dedicated the yeah. book to her. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I like talking about that part of the story. <laughs> You're but, very thoughtful. Go ahead. Okay. Now, Mr. Robarts obviously kept education for himself for a while because mm -hmm. he had you in mind for the job. Mm -hmm. Did you want the job? That's a bad way of phrasing it. <laughs> Did I think I was possibly able to do it? The answer to that is yes. Uh, did I end up doing it? Yes. Did I want to do it? That's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> Now you I know mean, why it took me 10 I, years to write the book. A while. <laughs> <laughs> and he's having so much fun. Why shouldn't I have some? Go ahead. Uh, okay, so you take over as Minister of Education. Yes. How much of a free hand did you have in running the department, and how much did you take orders from the boss? I took very little, by the way, of orders from Mr. What was his name again? Robarts. Oh, oh yeah, the, yes. Uh, I, I used to call him John, because he was not that much older than I was, but some. And... Uh, I, uh, I can't tell you now exactly how I felt about some things, but he did not interfere. Uh, I had no trouble in getting some things accomplished when I was Minister of Education, um, and uh, he did say to me once, you keep this up and maybe the party will have some trouble. <laughs> I won't tell you what those items were, but they were successful, and uh, that community has been a beneficiary ever since. Well, I, but don't I, even mention it. Go ahead. I think what you might be referring to is the fact that, that today, health has most of the money. You were in charge of 40 cents out of every dollar spent back in the day. So 50 years ago, education, colleges, universities, they got all the money. Yeah. And you were responsible for spending a lot of it, and the Tory uh, court had a problem. That is not true. I never spent a nickel of it, but others did. I see. Okay. Understood. Mr. Siegel did. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> the notion of creating the whole college system, why did you think that was a good thing to do? Uh, well, it turned out that way. I wasn't 100% sure, but I was very optimistic, and I felt that this was the right approach to take, and that's the approach I took, and it worked. Centennial started with a couple of hundred students, and they've got 50,000 today. And Seneca and George Brown, and they can all say the same thing. Started small, got big. You think that's, was that your best achievement as education minister, do you think, the college well, system? I, I think that's a very questionable question, <laughs> which is not unusual for you. <laughs> I, I have known him long enough to be able to be very frank with him. Uh, and he's trying to tell everybody just how he sort of ran the Ministry of Education. I was the minister, you weren't. Correct. That's, well, you remember I, that, do you? Well, I, I was barely born, but I was born. Yeah, okay. Yes. No, I, uh, the only thing I can tell you was that I had a feeling about education as being the most fundamental thing at any college or any university. I would say so even today. It's fine to talk about what's being done by the medical profession, many others, the legal profession, etc. The basis is still the educational system in this province in the area of education. <laughs> Listen, if you aren't well taught, in that, how far do you get in that? Go ahead. You had another question? <laughs> well, we're sitting here at OISE. Where did the notion of creating OISE come from? Uh, some very intelligent people. Uh, there are one or two present here, but I'm not going to mention their names because they may not feel comfortable with it. But uh, you see that one there. He, uh, he, he was some... What's your name again? That's uh, Dr. Charles Pascal. What's his name? Charles Pascal. Yeah. Yeah, He's, he went to Michigan. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, I apologize. He's a great soul. We've been friends for years, and he's been a great asset, except he doesn't bother to wear a tie, he doesn't get dressed properly, but apart from that, he's extremely able. <laughs> is there anything else I can say about you? <laughs> oh, oh, he's coming, is he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Not. Now, Bob Jackson. Uh, what made you put Bob Jackson in the job? 
because he was smarter than most of the people he was working with. Good reason. No, Good listen, reason. I, I'll be serious for a second. I knew him very well, and there are very few people who had the, shall we say, the talent, the ability, and the enthusiasm to deal with the issues that he did. We're here today partially because of Bob Jackson, and there's no question that he was that kind of person, and the kind of person that people didn't admire him necessarily, but they respected, and we owe a great deal to him. You, have a, you had, I should say, a kind of a holy trinity of three things as education minister. The college system, OISE, and then there was a third thing. What the heck? TVO, that's it. TVO was the third thing. Yes. You see how he works? He wants me to say something nice about his work at TVO. And so I'll say to all of you now, I watch him on occasion. I get bored to tears, but in spite of that, no, I don't. <laughs> Listen, I have to have some fun with him because he has fun with me on the, the tube. Uh, uh, why are you smiling? <laughs> Listen, she was a very good premier, uh, philosophically decided. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> uh, but if any of you think I've turned into a liberal, you're wrong. <laughs> so you still think she was philosophically misguided? I didn't say that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard it somewhere. But Listen, we're to be serious here. Carry on. Yes. You, yeah, you do occasionally watch the agenda. I know yeah, you do, because yeah. you call to complain all the time. <laughs> yeah. You well, I have every reason to complain. Do you listen to him all the time? How you, many do? Hold your hands up. You, you, you oh, do. well, quite a few. Oh, let's see. But you, yeah, about 10% of the group. Go ahead. You do, know, <laughs> you do know my boss is in the room, right? Are you going to say one nice thing about the agenda while oh, my boss is in the room? Oh, where, where's your boss? Lisa DeWild, right there. Well, I know exactly. She came and said hello to me. She's smarter than you are. Well, I know that. That's why she's the boss and I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, moving right along here. The notion of educational television. Where did that come from? Myself. Yes. And w why was it important to do? Because that's the way Worth was going and that's the way things have turned out. And I have no regrets. And uh, I hope you appreciate that you have been a beneficiary of what's happened. I. <laughs> I think you've told me in the past that if not for me, you'd be unemployed the last 25 years. I think, I think that's what you've said to me. I didn't realize that I'd be doing a borscht belt with Henny Youngman tonight, but apparently, <laughs> yeah. apparently that's what's on. All right. See what I have to put up with. Go ahead. <laughs> now, you also, I know you got, you got a lot of attention t 20 years on for making the announcement about extending public funding to Catholic schools right to the end. But before you did that, you actually extended by a couple of years when you were education minister. Did you get in a lot of trouble from your Tory core for extending funding to the Catholic school system? Well, there are several people here who can answer that. Are you one of them? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I knew exactly what might happen, and there was less than enthusiasm by some core members of the United Church of Canada. Uh, I happen to be a member of that church. Listen, I used to do well with that. Uh, I had a Sunday school, and during the winter months, if you behave yourself and did what you were supposed to do at five after 12, you could rush out and get into my car, only it wasn't a car, it was one of those things that could hold about 10 kids, and we'd rush into Toronto to a junior A hockey game. We had perfect attendance those nights. That's got nothing to do with anything else, but you should know that. <laughs> What's that got to do with Catholic school funding exactly? Well, some of them might have been Catholics. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. No, they weren't. I see. I see. Uh, okay. Let me move you along. We'll nudge you along through your years as education minister. And in December of 1970, Mr. Robarts announces that he's going to step down. He's been premier for almost a decade, and he's going to retire. Did you know right away you wanted to succeed him? I don't like the way you phrase it. <laughs> it's not a question of succeeding him. It was a question of determining Am I the right person to seek the opportunity and the responsibility of becoming minister in charge of the total uh, field? And I, I thought about it. My late father, uh, he was the Crown Attorney in Peel. Uh, he had had serious health problems. He was a great lacrosse player. Uh, I know that he might have, if he had been in a similar situation, might have gone that route. But uh, certainly, I knew what his history was and how that impacted me. I think it's fair to state that I had thought about it. And once I had made the decision, I thought it was in the interest of the province to have me at least to try uh, to be a leader. So that, that's the way it happened. I had some help 
My wife thought her thought it wasn't a bad idea. She said sometimes it wasn't a good idea. You're going to be away from home a lot, and I was. But uh, she has forgiven me. It, Haven't I, you? I, I should try to confirm that. <laughs> Is that true? Have you forgiven him? <laughs> she says I never say. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, you were only 41 years old when you became premier. Did you, did you worry you were too young? You see our friend next door to the, your associate, he's almost falling asleep. Uh, Mr. Sorbera. <laughs> yeah, Mr. he's a nice man. Yeah. Philosophically misguided, mind you, but very Understood. nice. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did, did you ask me again? Did, did you think you were too young at 41 to be premier? No, I didn't because I had at that point uh, been minister of education. I knew something about the system. I knew what I wanted the province to do, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't worry about the age. Okay. You know that you won at Maple Leaf Gardens on the fourth ballot at 2 o'clock in the morning by 44 votes. That was pretty close. Listen, I won. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was close. I knew it was going to be close. I knew some of the difficulties. I knew what some people were doing, etc. Uh, but in spite of all of that, uh, uh, things prevailed. and. Uh, I managed, and the thing that was wonderful about it, in spite of the fact that it was so close, uh, within weeks afterwards, I had very little difficulty dealing with or being friends with uh, those who did not make it that day, or that night, actually. Well, yeah. in fact, you might be referring, I don't know, but you might be referring to a rather famous meeting that took place at the National Club, where you got your opponent's people together. It was Alan Lawrence, and his people came, and your people came. Yeah and you got in a circle and sang Kumbaya, and the progressives and the conservatives kind of got it together. Uh, c can I fast forward a bit here, just for a moment? Do you well, listen, I can't stop you doing whatever you're doing. You go right ahead. Do, do, how much do you regret the fact that your party isn't all that progressive um, anymore? Listen, I didn't come here to talk about the uh, status of the uh, party uh, at this precise moment in history, and so I'm not going to deal with that. Oh, man. <laughs> I know, I know what you wanted me to say. Carry on. <laughs> okay. Sh should I ask you another non-controversial question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay. Go right ahead. What do you think about 28 students in the average class size? <laughs> I'll make this one observation. I'm not here to second guess uh, the present government. They are conservatives. I did emphasize the word progressive when I was premier. And I happen to know of the young lady, and she is young compared to me because I'm nearly 90. Uh, and I know what she has been saying, what she's been doing. I will only make this observation. I think in the last, uh, say, 10 days, there has been some improvement. And I hope there's a growing recognition on the part of her and the government that we're dealing with the most important part of the educational system, and that is our young people, and you want to do the right thing. And I think the right thing is not necessarily adding to the numbers in each individual classroom. I know that's controversial, but... So I, I have to express this hope that there will be an understanding of this, a greater understanding of it, and that particular issue will uh, uh, tend to be somewhat modified. Have you got any other bad things to ask? Well, I'm just debating with myself whether have, I should follow up. You see, up. the reason I'm wearing a hat is he hit me on the head, <laughs> <laughs> and I have no choice. But I want you to notice it says uh, University of Toronto on the front. Go ahead. It's, it's a lovely cap. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I, I should confirm. The reason I'm wearing this cast. The reason I'm wearing this cast is because he slashed me in my hockey game last week. <laughs> No, I didn't, but I should have. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you, do, you, do you want to play around with that subject a little more, education policy today? No, I, I uh, yes, I'll uh, say one thing. I, and I, I told my wife I was not going to come here and make uh, any controversial observations, uh, but I'll make one. I cannot understand the decision of the government of this province saying just the day after they became in charge, saying that the uh, universities that were committed by the previous gathering, as I recall, and please, would you please look up and admit that you were ready to give us $90 million to start the, uh, uh, yes, in, in the city of Brampton. And I, I found that difficult to understand, and I still do. The cancellation of the Ryerson. Yeah. 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 
And if everyone wants to know, the former premier applauded vigorously. <laughs> Good thing there's, uh, oh, well, don't you talk now. What are you about to say? <laughs> it's a good thing there's no reporters in this room or you might get in trouble. I am in trouble already. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Well, we shall see. All right. Let me, uh, okay, we'll go back in time then. Let's go back to the 1970s. You're now the premier. Um, one of the first things you did, I think you got sworn in in March and then in June, you gave a speech saying, Mr. Speaker, if we want to create uh, a transportation policy that accounts for cars, the Spadina Expressway is a great place to start, but if we want to build cities for people, the Spadina Expressway is a great place to stop. You canceled Spadina, you made a lot of people very angry over that, and of course you became a hero to a lot of others who are glad that you did it. How did you make that decision? Well, he should be here tonight, but he's not, and that's the former mayor of the city of Toronto, uh, because he was opposed to it. And I listened to, no, well, that's not the real reason at all. It was part of the reason, uh, but I thought it was the right thing to do. I have no misgivings about it. I know there's some people here who will probably say, gosh, I wish we had that uh, roadway. Probably you being one of them, but it's too late. <laughs> no one's gonna get it. No, I, it was a very difficult decision to make. There was a lady around who I will not refer to, but she was very bright and so on. She made several speeches on the subject, and Huey Siegel's sitting there smiling because he remembers her. Uh, and she was totally opposed to it. And uh, I wasn't the only one who uh, felt it was the right thing to do. And I, I have no regrets. And if some of you don't agree with me, if you want to hold up your hands, you may do so, but please don't while I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did sort of establish the fact that there was a new sheriff in town with a new way of doing business. And when you went to the public for an endorsement of those decisions and others, uh, you inherited a good-sized majority government from John Robarts, and then in October of 1971, you increased the size of it with an even bigger majority government. How a lot of them didn't live on that roadway. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's true. You <laughs> took a lot of seats from New Democrats and Liberals yeah. uh, in the what they used to call Metro Toronto because oh, of the Spadina decision. Uh, how, how gratified were you when you won such a big majority first time out? I, I don't like the word how gratified was I. I don't know. I mean, I'll be very honest, I was enthused, I worked hard, I believed in what I was doing, I believed in the history of the party, I was then the leader of it, and I, I, I guess I was pleased. I had to be pleased with it, yes. I would think so, yeah. I would think so. Cause... And I had some very nice people helping me, working for me, and or not for me, but with me, and I thought it was a very good result. I mean, some later on weren't quite as good. Uh, well, You'll refer to those, but not, not too soon. I, we, can, no, we, we can go there. That sounds like a good idea, because uh, almost immediately, you got into trouble. Not you personally, your government. Uh, got into some, as is inevitably the case in public life, there were some controversies, there were some tough decisions that uh, didn't perhaps meet with the favor of as many people as you'd have liked. Uh, you tried to restructure government in such a way that created some rivalries in cabinet. By the time it was all said and done, 1975 comes, and you are kind of hanging on by the skin of your teeth with a minority government. How'd you like that? Well, I don't have teeth that have skin. <laughs> Where did you get that phrase from? I mean, I didn't want to embarrass you in front of this very distinguished group, but why would you talk about you skin You don't want to embarrass teeth? me in front of this group? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. all you've been doing for the last half an hour. <laughs> well, carry on. How long are we going to be here? <laughs> get used to it. Well, I do recall the august Mr. Siegel saying, what are you people all worried about? I'm from federal conservative politics. This is a fantastic result. We're still in power. But I think you were perturbed about the fact that this was the first minority since George Drew. Well, I was perturbed, but I was looking forward to it because it did turn out to be actually more fun in terms of running the system. And Huey Siegel will tell you, because he was there, uh, it took more work, took more thought, et cetera. And so uh, while I would like to have won by a large number, uh, I, I sort of half enjoyed it in a way, but in a way uh, with the confrontation that took place. But the one thing I found was the other two parties, and don't take exception to this, they didn't agree with one another. So if one party opposed me, the other one was in support, and vice versa. In fact, she was there. No, were you there then? No, not no, yet. You weren't. Well, then I, uh, your predecessors were very kind, because when they should have been opposed, they weren't, and when they were opposed, the other party wasn't. That was a brilliant solution. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> If, I, I, reading between the lines, what I think you were saying was, 
we, boy, when we were covering Queens Park back in the day, when we covered Queens Park back in the day, we would tape you in scrums afterwards, and then we'd go back to our bureaus and play back the tape, and we'd try and figure out what the hell you had just said, because <laughs> oftentimes, I think the word circumlocution was invented for this bit, because it went around and around, and if, we really did try hard to figure out what you were saying. So I'm gonna try here. You had a knack of being able to divide your opponents in such a way you could tack left to get the NDP support on some stuff, you could tack right to get the liberal support on some stuff, because the liberals were a more right-wing rural party back then than they are today. And the bottom line was, I think you could do that because you were not an ideological, small c conservative kind of guy. You, you could occupy that broad progressive conservative middle. Is that what you were trying to say? Huey, can you answer that? <laughs> I mean, he was there full time, etc. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll have to be honest. I'm not sure I planned anything that way. What I did want to do was to do the right thing, survive, etc., and it worked. It did. And two years later, you thought your polling numbers were so good that you orchestrated your own demise, called a snap election, and had another minority parliament. But more members. More members, true yeah. enough, yeah. more members. Um, one of whom was Bob Elgy, who was a real good get for you guys. He was a very fine person, yes. indeed. Um, from what I am told, you made a decision at that point uh, not to try any more shenanigans on the floor of the legislature. That I you never would, did that, but go ahead. That you would try to serve the whole four years, be very collegial in your exercising of power and in, in the running of the business of the province of Ontario. And that minority parliament lasted four years. You, you, you ran a minority parliament for six years, which is tough to do. Any secrets or tricks along the way that you can share with us? No, I can't, because I didn't have any. I mean, I don't, I'm not a person that has tricks. I don't, I don't like you're using that terminology. <laughs> okay, well, let me rephrase. I mean, I, I do you use tricks when you're using that toy you've got in your hand? No. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> How, how much did, you, you got on with Stephen Lewis, who was the leader of the NDP at the time, very yes. well, yes? How, that feels like a very unusual relationship because you two, it would seem, had nothing in common. Uh, I think we had one or two things in common. I don't know whether Stephen Lewis is here. If he is, I wish him well because I like him. And I like the other gentleman who I'll be seeing sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you remember who that is? Is that Bob Nixon? No. No, Stuart Smith? No. Bob Ray? Any, any well deserved well person would know immediately it was Bob Ray. Bob Why Ray. would you okay. go through all these other well, names? I, uh, <laughs> I thought you were talking about a liberal leader. No, okay. I'm talking about people. Okay. I'm talking about people, yes. Okay. yes. Of course, by the time Bob Ray got there, you had a majority back, so I didn't think you had to be that nice to him. But no, you had I, to I, I wasn't there to be nice. I was there to listen to him. He had some good ideas. He had some not so good, but I, I liked him. You can like people that are opposed to you if you know that they're there and believe in what they're doing. And Bob Ray believed in what he was doing. If he were here today, tonight, uh, he would say with a hesitation, he still believed in what he did and didn't succeed. Yes. Uh, now, you have to be careful. You should never think of running yourself. Go ahead. Uh, I never have, trust me, <laughs> yes. 1981, four years of minority government are over. You kept your word, you go back to the people, call an election, and such was born the expression, the realities of March 19th. You got your majority government back. How important was that to you? Well, I, I, I think I have to say I felt better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't sit there with a minority government and not worry a little bit. Uh, no, I, I, I'll be very modest here, but I did feel some measure of accomplishment, and it turned out to be very helpful and uh, we were able to do quite a bit in the ensuing years. Which we'll get to now. Uh, three things in particular I want to touch on. Number one, uh, not necessarily in order of importance, but this one still has lasting impact. You, you were at the Grey Cup game in 1982 with Paul Godfrey, the then Metro chairman. It started to pour rain. The people started to chant, we want a dome, we want a dome. And seven years later, we had a dome. It took me a long time. <laughs> but essentially, you made the decision to have the Dome Stadium happen. I, I did, because I thought, from a cultural standpoint, 
uh, particularly if you were a football player or uh, basketball or whatever, uh, it's been a great thing for the city and, and those of us who live beyond the city. Indeed. Yes. Uh, second thing, and I would say with uh, even more significance in terms of nation building, uh, you and the current Prime Minister's father and the other First Ministers of the day got together to try to repatriate the Constitution with a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It looked like it was a hopeless endeavor. You burned a lot of political capital by siding with Pierre Trudeau when lots of your Tory friends thought it was nuts for you to snuggle up to Pierre Trudeau. Um, interrupt, you want to come in there? Or should I pop no, the question? carry on. Okay. Yes, well, I know okay. what you're going to ask. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the 11th hour. It looks like it's falling apart. There's you and Dick Hatfield and Pierre Trudeau and that's it. And this whole other gang of eight who's opposed. You call Pierre Trudeau late one night and you say to him, what? Well, uh, this was after, I think, a day and a half or two days. Huey was there with me and others, uh, and where it was obvious that we had to do the right thing, and that was the introduction of an amendment to the Act. Uh, I won't go through the details of it, and uh, that is what I phoned at that evening about 10.30 and said to the Prime Minister, I think you should do this. Uh, and he was not rough, he wasn't upset, but he ultimately said yes. And that to this day was more important than almost anything else I contributed to the history of this, uh, this country. The following day, everybody voted in favor of it, except the Premier of the province of Quebec, who had not been informed by the then Prime Minister, which I never understood, I'm not sure he would have accepted it, but it did, in fact, uh, work. I mean, I, I happen to know the person who followed the present prime minister, not the present one, but the one then. Um, I was at a, a dinner, and this has nothing to do with you, but I'll talk about it anyway. Roy McMurtry was one of my great friends and a very able person. And he had a very quiet dinner one night, he had to be uh, then uh, premier of the province of, uh, uh, I think, uh, somewhere between Manitoba and, uh, yeah, no, yes. Roy Romano. Ro Roy yeah. Romano. Yeah, and uh, the former person who was uh, prime minister. Jean Chrétien. And Jean had written material, had speaked about it. He never understood who made that phone call. I mean, there's a bit of history that no one will understand, but the reality is, it was that phone call, I think, that maybe, maybe saved this country, made it what it is today, and is something for which I don't take a lot of pride and so on because I believe in it strongly and I would have done it no matter what had happened. And the reality is that today we have this country which if we hadn't done it, we might not have. I have to speak to the uh, pr former prime minister on occasion because I tease him. I said, you've been making big speeches. You've been telling everybody what happened and you never knew. And that was factually correct. I was talking to him the other day, it's in his book that he has now written. And he's gonna come here to Toronto sometime. We're gonna to have lunch together. And he wants to thank me again for what happened because it was very fundamental. And Huey was part of this discussion as well, one or two others here. It was one of the most fundamental things, I think, uh, that we did uh, all the time I was Premier. <laughs> yeah. I, I cannot imagine there were too many people who could put an ultimatum to Pierre Trudeau and say, unless you accept the notwithstanding clause, Ontario is going to have to withdraw support. No, I, I didn't do that, but what I did say to him was this, that if he meant to go to the UK, which was part of his, uh, his approach, that he would go to the UK, make the presentation to that government, and have a success by them of what should happen here in Canada, and I was very, very sure that perhaps in the UK they would have said no and we would have had nothing. And so, uh, I mean, that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to finish the circle, you ended up having dinner at Roy McMurtry's house with Jean Chrétien and Roy Romano. And Jean Chrétien, until that moment, didn't know that you had he, made that phone call. He did not know. But he's now written a book, and if you want to get his book, there's in the at book. least a couple of lines where he does. Uh, no, I'm teasing. It, no, yeah. it's in the book. It's yeah. in his book. Yeah. And it's in the book about you, too, incidentally. Yeah. I know you won't know that because you haven't read it yet. <laughs>
not, not, not that I'm upset about that, but I, yeah, I'm over it anyway. Uh, okay, one more thing in that last term that I want to touch on. You flirted very hard with running for the federal Progressive Conservative Party leadership, which became vacant in 1983. And uh, Brian Mulroney, John Crosby, Joe Clark, David Crombie, who's here, uh, who else? Peter Pocklington, Michael Wilson, the late great, uh, all ran for it, and you thought about it for a long time. You ultimately decided not to go. How come? It's very difficult to answer, but my wife said I shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, she did not say that. No, I thought about it a great deal. Uh, I had been involved with the province for those numbers of years. Uh, I felt comfortable that I perhaps could, because that had been my ambition. Uh, when I go back before I became a member of the House here in Ontario, uh, Gordon Graydon was our federal member in Peel. He was a very close friend of my father's. Uh, he had two or three of the leading uh, leaders of the Tory party come to Grace United Church, uh, where I got to meet them. And there was no question, there was a period of time when that would have been for me uh, what I thought was the right thing. Uh, but then I am wiser because of the years that went by. I had enjoyed being the premier, and I said to myself, I'm not sure if this is right for me. I had five children. Uh, we now have 10 children. We now have 12 grandchildren. I mean, all of this was part of what I thought about, and uh, I made just, just the decision not to. He, he, he says 10 children because you mean you're five plus their spouses. Yeah, well, they're children. That's right. Yes, so he's okay. got 10 kids in that respect yeah. and 12 grandkids and one or two, two great-grandchildren. Yeah. Okay. You've done pretty well. That's nice. That's <laughs> nice. Any regrets about not seeking that federal Tory leadership po post? Uh, listen, uh, who knows? Uh, if I go back that length of time, I might have been upset or d disappointed that I didn't. But listen, I made the decision. I mean, you people have to be bored with some of this, but uh, this is how people do work. And I was interested, there's no question I was interested. Uh, Neil is looking there, smiling, because uh, he's one of those who said, maybe you should, maybe you should. Um, and I made I, a decision which I have no regrets that I made. Because uh, it was my ambition. Before I ever became involved in politics here in the province of Ontario, I wanted to be uh, in Ottawa. But I made the decision not to. And I, I have no regrets. Because I might have won. <laughs> no guarantee. <laughs> and you see my friend up here, he was the uh, governor general. He's almost asleep. Why are you nodding your head? No, there? he's being pensive. <laughs> he, oh, I he, see. He is okay. Pensively in agreement. <laughs> okay. okay. The next big decision that you had to make was, and if you're keeping score, he's won four elections in a row at this point. Last Premier of Ontario to win four straight elections? I bet even you don't know this. Who's the last Premier of Ontario to win four straight elections? Not Mowat. You don't have to go that far back, but you know, I'm not surprised nobody knows because it's 100 years ago and nobody was around. Uh, James Whitney was the last one to win four straight. And you. It's a short list. Uh, short list in the last century, that is. You had to decide. Your party was putting a great deal of pressure on you to lead them into a fifth election, which even Bob Ray says you would have easily won. I agree with him. Uh, or, after 25 years in public life, retire, retire and do something else. Uh, we know what decision you made. How tough was that one? It, it was very difficult because I think the opportunities to win was there. At the same time, I had spent a good part of my life. I had neglected my family to a certain extent. And I made the decision that while it might work out quite well in political terms, uh, there was more to life than just being premier of the province. I, I'm going to commandeer the microphone a little bit right now to share a story that, that others have told me about you at this moment. Your son Neil said, you, told, you took, gathered everybody in, um, uh, at Honey Harbor, at the cottage, Thanksgiving weekend, and you told them all. And there were tears around the table when you, when you told them all you were retiring as premier. First thing Neil says is, He's Minister of Education for almost nine years, Premier for almost 14 years. We're going to have to send him back for driver's ed. He hasn't driven a car in 24 years. <laughs> That's Neil's line. 
<laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> the second thing is, your party wanted you to run again because they knew you'd win again. But one of the reasons I'm told you couldn't do that is that you couldn't go into the media studio and tell the members of the media and through them to the public, because the first question would be, will you serve the whole term? Or are you just doing this to run and then retire a year later? And you said, I'm told, I can't do that. I can't lie to people and say, I'm gonna run and serve the whole term when I know I don't want to. Is that true? I hate answering you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is true. I was not going to run and stay for a year, maybe a year and a half. It was not within me to do that. If I had run, it would have been for three and a half years uh, and to give somebody else a chance to get started, etc. And it was a very important decision on my part. And uh, some people here might not make that decision, but I wasn't going to do it for a year, a year and a half. It just was not me. I think it's worth observing that um, George Washington might have said, I cannot tell a lie. And um, Richard Nixon might have said, I cannot tell the truth. <laughs> and I would never have said that, but go ahead. <laughs> and Donald Trump might have said, I cannot tell the difference. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I should have said that. I, but, he likes Donald Trump. But I, yeah, think, I, think it's, I think it's interesting and worth <laughs> noting that you found it difficult to lie to people at that okay, moment when a good political lie would have served your interest very well. I just make that observation. You don't even have to say anything if you don't want to. No, I'll just say that on some occasions you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me do one more question, then we'll open it up for questions here. I th have we got microphones that we're going to, yes, distribute in the audience for people who want to ask? We'll do a little Q&A. You're going to steal this one? Then I'll move over here and we'll do this. No, I okay. that one should still be oh, is it? Okay. Is there, I mean, you know, you had a good run as Minister of Education, you had a good run as Premier of Ontario. Uh, you never lost an election, ever, whether you're running as an MPP or leading the government or running for leadership. You never lost. Is there anything you didn't get done that you wish, as you look back at it now, you had? Let's see if that's working. Your, your lapel mic. Lapel mic? Yeah, you're good. Is it working? Yeah. I have no idea. Really? Nothing? No. You got Listen, I, you can't look back. I mean, my life was spent being with the government in the province of Ontario. I was quite prepared to retire. I wasn't going to second guess. I haven't second guessed since, in spite of some people like Hugh Siegel who said I might have been able to make it federally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I have no regrets. It was the right thing to do, and I haven't worried about it ever since. That's a nice place to be after 25 years in public life. Yeah, Very good. I've been lucky. Okay. We're going to do some questions from the floor now for the time that we have remaining. Do Mike you... Chuck. Mike Chuck. Yep, yeah, that one's working. Sim, you've got the mic. Who is going to be brave in a Canadian audience notorious for nobody wanting to go first? There. Okay, Sim, up in the top there. Very good. And here, tell us your name, and, um, and let's try and get as many questions in as we can, so questions as opposed to is speeches would breath? be good, if I can say that delicately. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is John Sarunas. I'm uh, uh, a graduate of, of this fine institution, uh, and also University of Toronto. Um, and and it's, a, it's an honor to, I've always admired you, Mr. Davis, and it's an honor to uh, hear you speak tonight. Um, I cut my teeth on politics when I was an eight-year-old watching Dobie Gillis and then all of a sudden the Nixon-Kennedy debate stuff started and I got into politics very passionately, went on to study politics and history at the University of Toronto and I just want to ask you, I, I, I've, with, with the stuff that's going on today and what I've heard you speaking about, uh, politicians, I, I was inspired by uh, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, uh, Diefenbaker, uh, Pearson, yourself of course, Mr. Robarts, and I think what, what was predominant in the, in the era of the day that is sorely lacking today is honesty, 
empathy, truth, integrity. Where has that gone? And, and now we've got these ideologues, um, and, and, I, and I fear for the future, I really do. Okay, let's get an answer on that. D is there a dearth of honesty and integrity in politics today in your judgment? Now listen, you're always very shy, but you've been part of the political scene in your own way. You've seen what has happened, you see the people involved. I think it's time you made a decision and you answer the question. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm pretty I'm serious. sure the question was I to mean, you. The question that he maybe has more relevance south of the border than here, but there is some relevance here. And I'd be very interested to hear what you might say about your assessment of the political scene here in Canada at this moment. I think you should watch the agenda to find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, listen, I say to you, sir, uh, I, I don't want to dodge it, etc. You always go through periods of some difficulty, some complexity uh, with respect to the federal discussions at the moment. Uh, I've read what I have read, you read it, you've seen it on television, it's worrisome. And whether it is something that has happened uh, uh, without any thought whatsoever, I don't know. I'm not a part of it. All I can say is that I believe in this country. I'm a great Tory, but I'm a great Canadian first. And I think that in spite of it, whatever complexity arises, you can sit back, be comfortable. We will sort out in a way that's appropriate. I don't like to think uh, we'll run through a period where we're very critical of the principles and so on. I can disagree with one or two who are in Ottawa now, but listen, they could disagree with me when I was when I, where I was. I, I just hope you don't worry about it too much. Thank you for the question. Who's next? Yeah. Right here. Gentleman with the glasses on right here. Thanks, Sim. How old are you? Uh, 21. Okay, you're on. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, we got you. Go ahead. I'll try it again. I tell you what you do, come down here I'm, and I'm going to run out here like well, Phil Donaghy used to. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, so my question, um, Mr. Davis, is, um, so I know how you were very influential in drafting our, helping to get our constitution. That I'm having have. trouble. Oh, sorry. Um, I can't hear you. Repatriating our Constitution and the 1982 Constitution. Um, as you know, uh, were things in the Constitution that kind of weren't addressed at the time, and there were amendments afterwards recognizing Indigenous rights, Senate reform, and of course, we had two other kind of accords that failed, and then things kind of went to the back burner, and it was always felt like it would never, things would never change and move forward. Of course, things have changed now. We have more emphasis on recognizing things like indigenous rights, there's more call for Senate reform. Could, could big uh, constitutional reform kind of like how they had or changes ever happen or is that something that will never you think happen again? Can you, can you imagine us taking another round of constitutional can negotiations? You, can you give me just a, a breakdown of what he was asking? Sure. Can, yeah. you, can you imagine us undertaking another round of constitutional negotiations the likes of which you did in 1981 to sort of finish up some unfinished business. You know, Quebec still hasn't signed indigenous rights, et cetera. I, I don't see it happening in the immediate future, no. I don't say it shouldn't, I just say I don't think uh, that there is uh, a feeling by the various parties that they want to go through this route. I don't think it's there. Now, Mr. Siegel, who's an expert, will say maybe it should. Mr. Siegel? No, he's no. shaking his head too. No, no appetite I, right I, now, right? I just don't think it's there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's next? Okay, uh, I see the lady with, yes, your hand is up right now. Yes, but please. Sir, yes, sir, ladies first is what I believe in. Hi. Hello I there. I teach your voice, I don't need this. Okay. <laughs>
You're much younger than I am. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, if you're referring to what has, uh, I warned you about this. I didn't want to get into a present debate on these issues, but I will say this, that I am hopeful that the profession and the minister involved, I think she's a good person, and that the premier will understand that the teaching profession has every right to contribute their views to be a part of the discussions that lead to the ultimate recommendations. And I'm hopeful that some of that will start. I think he has to a certain extent, and I'm just hopeful it will continue so that the teaching profession will feel some comfort. And most importantly, they will contribute in a way that we are better off to have whatever they feel should be done for the teachers and for the kids. Uh, I'm hopeful that will happen. I can't tell you what it will be. I don't know. But uh, if you're, as a teacher, concerned that some things have to be done, some things recognized, you will not get an argument from me. I wouldn't be allowed to go home because my wife taught school in San Francisco. She thinks we do pretty well here, but she thinks on occasion there are rooms for improvement. She will not say that out loud because she's smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. He looks familiar. Get gentleman up, Gentlemen right here with uh, Sim. Yes, right in front of you, Sim. Thanks. Um, Mr. Davis, one of the important initiatives that your government You just have to hold it in a certain way. <laughs> that, that your government introduced was the policy of multiculturalism. So I'd like, I wonder if you could just expand on that with John Yaremko and Leon Kassar. This was something that your government introduced before the federal government did. Sir, I, I apologize. Can you? Multiculturalism. You, you, you seemed unusually open to multiculturalism. Let me put it this way. You seemed unusually open to multiculturalism for a waspy guy from Brampton. <laughs> Can I put it that way? I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> what was this waspy business? Listen, just empirically how many, provable facts, hands, How many could you tolerate him for more than 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you, Charles. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Say well, what you, you heard you, again. You, you seemed unusual, even though your background, obviously yeah. there was, there was uh, Brampton, when you were growing up, is hardly the Brampton of today. It was a not at all diverse place. And yet his point is you seemed unusually open to multiculturalism. You appointed John Yaramko. You appointed the first female cabinet minister ever as well. You seem very open to this. Why? Why? Because I think it's the right thing to do. But you have to do it properly. You have to do it with some understanding as to what changes need to be made, etc. I think there's room in this province for people who have different backgrounds, etc. And sir, you may or may not agree with me. My late father, uh, he grew up with next to nothing. He became a lawyer. He became one of the best Crown attorneys ever had in the writing of Peel. And he would sit here, if he were here today, he would say to me, understand this, the people who started this province and this country aren't the ones who necessarily are going to run it for all their lives. You have to open your mind and your views, etc. There are people, and you're not one of them, sir, I can tell by looking at you, but there are some here who I think have been assets to this province, and I hope it continues. Very nice. Right. <laughs> Who's next? Up in the back there, yes. Very good, yes, we'll just get the microphone to you. There's a lot of people here, you know, you're, you're a bit of a draw. No, I'm not, it was you, they came no, to I hear you. I don't think yeah. so, I don't think so. <laughs> yes, please. I, uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Premier, uh, Mr. Davis. My name is Jason Murai, I'm also alumni at OISE, went to U of T. Thank you for all that you did for this province. Uh, I did learn a new fact about you, your consideration to actually run for the federal level and subsequently prime minister. And if I can ask you, if you did decide, or if you had decided to run, what was your vision of Canada at that point? If you'd run for the national PC party leadership, on what vision of Canada would you have run? Uh, an acceptance by all parts of Canada to the reality that we are different in various provinces. There had to be an understanding 
that the province of Quebec was not the same as the province of Ontario, that Alberta on occasion might have been, no, I won't say what I might have said, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, what I would have worked at was to get some understanding that you can have different views and points of view and things that you believe in in various parts of the country, but you can make one issue very important, that is to the future of Canadians, and we could do that. I mean, I, if I had ever run, I shouldn't say these things, I was not worried about whether or not uh, there would be some degree of understanding right across the country. It's not perfect now, but it's better than it was 30 years ago. I, I'm very optimistic that we will, as a country, in spite of some of the complexities of the present moment, uh, that we'll continue to do well. And if you don't think so, speak to me after. I'll pay attention, but I may disagree with you. Jason, one of the reasons some people told him he shouldn't run is that he didn't speak French. Are you mad at yourself for not learning French at an earlier age? Uh, no, I, I never can afford to get mad at myself because other people get mad at me often enough I don't need to do it myself. <laughs> That's a terrible question. That's a great question. Are no, you kidding? No, no, a terrible if, question. If, if you I'm not going to watch him on the evening <laughs> anymore. I mean, uh, you heard me say that, did you? Yes. But if you were as, Listen, that lady's your boss. I'm well aware. <laughs> okay. if, if, uh, if you were as fluently bilingual as Brian Mulroney had been, you never know. You might have jumped in, because that was certainly considered uh, an X against your campaign. Well, I'm sure it was, but I also felt I had the ability to learn enough of uh, the French language, maybe one or two others, that I might have been able to do it. Uh, but that was not the sole reason, believe me, yeah. no. Do you want to tell the story about when, when you went to Quebec to give a speech and then René Levesque called you the next day? Do you remember that story? It's no, in the book. You, you, you tell it. Okay, well, it's, it's in the book that you haven't read. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Um, and I'll find out whether he's making things up, so go ahead. <laughs> My recollection is that during the constitutional negotiations, you went to Quebec, you gave a speech in English, obviously, with a few words of French in there as well. You, 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 you could, when you needed and wanted to, you could do, do it some in French. And, um, and there was a big debate in your office, I think, about whether to do it because you know, here's the Premier of Ontario coming into Quebec, and okay, it, it, was, it, it was not without its risk. René Levesque calls you the next day, and he, you say to him, and you two are friends, amazingly enough, um, René, are you mad at me for coming into your province and giving this speech? He said, are you kidding? Our poll numbers went up a couple of points. Please come back. <laughs> That is factually correct. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't go back right away. <laughs> but we were friends then, we continue to be friends, even after the constitutional mm -hmm. issues, yes. We have a question from a president from a post-secondary institution right here. Mr. Patterson, the microphone is yours once it gets there. What institution? Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Patterson, president of Niagara College and a proud graduate oh, well, of What Boise. college is that again? Niagara College. Oh, I, I've heard of you. Okay. Uh, you and I have talked on the phone. That's correct. You've extolled the virtues of having a college system. Indeed. But you did say in some of the observations you made talking to me that you have the finest of all of them. Well, no, no. <laughs> Colleges are exciting places to be right now. Mr. Davis, and, and I, you know, when you began that journey of the college movement, it was really a response to the economic circumstances of the time. And now fast forward 51 years, I, th I think you can be very proud of uh, the nimbleness and the link to the world of work through program advisory committees, which were critical building blocks in that system. I was wondering if you wanted to make a few comments about your impressions of, of the college system in Canada and Ontario right now. And again, thank you so but much. You, you don't expect me to say anything other than it's a great thing. No, no. <laughs> a lot of issues, I'd, I'd love to hear the good and the bad. No, no, yeah. listen. Uh, what has happened in the college system uh, is something that help, I think has helped make this province. The only time I've been a little bit disturbed, and I hope you don't take offense, was when that uh, uh, debate went on and they weren't working for a little longer period of time. I nearly phoned you to say, listen, two weeks is long enough to have this happen, and would you please consider finding a way to get it over with? And that's the, it's the only time I've been uh, somewhat critical of the view of the government of the day, and I hope you understand that I'm only saying it because I believe in it. But I have to say this, 
uh, the college system has been, without any question, one of the great pluses here in the province of Ontario. I'm not taking any credit. I know enough about it to know that it has had a great effect. And uh, I, I just want to thank you because you've done very well. I don't like some of the courses you've had because they do tend to relate to having you look after your own. No, I'm teasing you. I, listen, he's a very nice person, but he sometimes just you know, a little concerned that he wants to be foot and center in that uh, geographic area. And you're looking at your watch, not you, sir, the gentleman <laughs> in front of him. <laughs> can I, yeah. Mr. Davis, can I do a brief follow-up on this? Because I'm sure yeah. Premier Wynne faced these kinds of pressures all the time, too. And that is, there, there are colleges out there that want to become universities. And they, they want you, they wanted her, they want, yes, they wanted both of you to, to make that happen. But you see how wise she is. She didn't try, and they know enough I wouldn't try. We have universities, we have colleges, and there was no way I was going to suggest that the colleges should become universities. Yeah, did I tell you not to? Well, then, and you paid attention. I think all of you should applaud the former premier of this province who paid some attention. <laughs> And if I see anything in the paper tomorrow morning that says that, oh, no, it won't. <laughs> so you're not in favor of that? No. No, God. listen, we have great universities. What people don't quite understand is that we've gone through a system getting our universities. Huey Siegel, I shouldn't point him out, but he's a very fine person. I mean, he went to a university in Ottawa uh, that was not part of the system in that sense of the word. Uh, we had to buy it out from the church. I mean, how many churches did we approach? We approached the church in Windsor, and Windsor became a totally independent institution. I could give you three others. And Wrenching. a lot of people don't know of these things happening, but they have, and our university system is by and large not in any way related to the church. And, and now like my late that. mother might say that's terrible, but that's the way it should be, and that's the way it is. Gotcha, question at the back. Mm. Just jiggle the microphone a little bit. Find the right, there's a right angle and then it'll work. Okay, shout. Born in Italy, had a Catholic education. I'm running up there again, hang on. More hey, exercise. Listen, if he's no good on the two, he's very good at running. Hello, me. Go. Do I get? The microphone working. So. Do you live in Brampton? And there is a question. I have never voted conservative in my life. I've only voted liberal. But my question to you is, given my background, what would it take? <laughs> don't, don't mind our backs here, it's okay. What would it take to entice you to run again in politics to teach people what ethics and morals and respect for students are? <laughs> you want to shake hand? Thank you. I'll talk to my wife, I'll think about it. <laughs> but I'm very thank flattered, you thank you very much. Can I just thank you because I was born in Italy so and I came here to learn to speak French and I'm one of the first graduates, and I taught in the community college system for 30 years. I'm one of the first graduates of the community college leadership program, thanks to you, so that's another thank you for you. Uh, thank Bravo, you very signor. much. Bravo, molto bene. Mm -hmm. Grazie. Okay, who else has got a question here? We got a hand? Right there, okay. Want to pass the microphone over? He looks familiar. <laughs> This, thank you. Uh, before asking the question, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Davis, for a letter you wrote in the summer of 19, uh, in the spring of 1967, to the Minister of Immigration, that admitted me to Canada to come work in this bill, come work in this institution. So thank you. Um, three years later, <laughs> uh, my name is Stacy Churchill. 
three years later, I w entered the senior administration of this institution. I believe I'm the last Mohican alive of that generation. Uh, coming right now to the question, um, a few years after that, you um, made this crucial decision to give uh, control of the post-secondary system in the public side to the Catholics, to the Catholic uh, uh, boards. This happened almost by coincidence only three or four months before a decision was a decision was made on the constitutional reference that gave control of schools, the decision to give the control of schools to the Francophones. And I've always been w wondered if Roy McMurtry or someone like that had convinced you to do this because otherwise the Catholics would have had control of the post-secondary system, but not, uh, the Catholic French would have had control of their post-secondary system, but not the, the non-Francophones. Uh, non I've, always, I've always wondered what went into that decision other than just thinking it was right. Could you il enlarge on that just a little bit for us? Thank you, sir. I need some help. <laughs> I, I heard some of it, but not enough. Yeah, Did you the, hear the, enough? The, the microphone kept going on yeah. and off, so we missed some of it. But is your, is your p point that he offered extended funding for Catholic high schools all the way to the end of grade 13 to form a seamless Before, governance system through universities? No, that, no. What I'm saying is that he took a judicious decision just before the first the Ontario Court of Appeal on, ref, on referendum and then later the Supreme Court of Canada gave control of schools to Francophones who were in their vast majority Catholic. It therefore was only three or four months before this happened that the decision was gave control of the schools to the Catholics in Canada up to grade 13 what in terms of public talking? funding. What year are you talking? Do you recall? Whoa, I lived it. <laughs> And I was I was involved in it. The constitutional ref, the constitutional reference was 1972, uh, the decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal, I believe. Okay. And the um, the the Mayan thing came only in 1976. Yeah. That's uh, 48 years ago. It's uh, this one's going to be tough to remember. But go ahead. It's very difficult to remember. The only thing I can tell you, sir, is this: that we did something that I believed in then, I believe in now, and where there's been a, a measure of acceptance is that we did to the Catholic Church what we have did, did to the balance of the economy. Uh, it's not perfection, but it's very close to it. And I have no uh, misgivings, no regrets that uh, the Catholic community is teaching well and that they believe in certain things. And while I taught uh, Sunday school, uh, I have to remind you that there is something fundamental about uh, uh, churches, etc., and I had no reservation about saying that the Catholic community should have the same rights, privileges, and money as the non-Catholic community. <laughs> That's the way it has happened. It has worked, and I don't hear anything much these days other than maybe the odd uh, uh, Tory, like myself, says, why did you ever do that? I would have no hesitation in saying I did it because I thought it was right. Mr. Davis, let me use my moderator's prerogative to ask one last question before Dean Jones comes up and winds this up. Well, this, I want to hear him speak. Well, you well he will. To, uh, okay. Trust me, he will. <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, just a few months away from turning 90. And I just am curious about, I mean, that's a big number. And many of your friends from politics never got that far. They didn't get nearly that far. Frank Miller, Larry Grossman. I mean, the list goes on. What do you think as you look back at 90 years on Earth? I think it's been pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I have a son here. I have a granddaughter. I have my wife. You want me to say that it's not been good? You want me to say that I haven't enjoyed it? You want me to say that I haven't had some accomplishment, perhaps, in all of this? Uh, why would I do that? Why would you ask that question? I may not listen to you anymore on the tube. Uh, listen, you can fire him, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't give her any ideas. Um, Mr. Davis, you haven't lost an inch off your fastball. It's been great to share the stage with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't help but you. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it is my quite unfortunate responsibility to bring this, uh, this stimulating conversation to a close. Um, as we conclude, I just want to ask the audience if they could just stay in their seats for a few minutes after we're going to transition Mr. Davis to another small event. And it would be just helpful if people stayed in their places for a little while. Um, I, I, before I do that, though, I want to like to thank Mr. Davis especially and Mr. Pakin for this truly wonderful conversation. I mean, for those... For, <laughs> It's, it, it certainly harkens back to the wonderful kind of personality that emerged that, that you have, wonderful sense of humor that you have. And thank you so much for sharing this once again with our audience. And, pro and let me just take a moment to provide you with a small token of our appreciation for your wonderful time this evening. Thank you. Am I allowed to accept this University of Toronto? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. So I, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this <laughs> afternoon. My final thanks are to Mr. Davis uh, for having the foresight to create OISE, but for more importantly, I think, for your huge contribution to education um, across the spectrum, not just school education, but across the spectrum through adulthood in this great province. So thank you very much, and thanks to all of you. Good night. Thank you.